33 story hotel and condo project. I'd probably be okay, like, like that. Okay, stop. Tap. This is a plan by the community for the community. This one here. <laughs> no problem, Ken. Thanks for having me. It's Kent Mulgat for Kelowna Now. And we're joined by Norm Letnick, our Liberal MLA for Kelowna Lake Country. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for the invite, Ken. Right, and we were talking about why we brought you in. And I think I want to reiterate the fact that I think the best thing that we can do, given the 10 minutes that we have, is to give people a chance to get to know you a little better. Well, well I'm a father of three, married for 37 years to Len. My three kids uh, live in Kelowna, uh, work here. Uh, I have a wonderful granddaughter, Luna, so pride in my life. And um, I just, uh, all my life, I'm 60 now, all my life I've been volunteering uh, on everything from being a Boy Scout to teaching and climbing uh, to uh, being on Chamber of Commerce, uh, Tourism Bureau, uh, Town Council, City Council, now an MLA. Uh, I love volunteering at the Gospel Mission, In From the Cold, you okay. name it. That's, that's right, so, so your approach to politics is that it, it, you take... Uh, it's public service. It's a call to serve. It's, it's a call to serve. And whether, whether you do it as an elected official or in a non-elected capacity, it's the same drive that's, that calls you to serve. Uh, you know, some people serve as ministers, other people serve as nurses or teachers. In my case, I serve in more of a community uh, sense. So the Walk right. of Knox, for example, the fourth annual that we're doing uh, in a couple of weeks, that's just another call to serve, bring the community together and uh, make sure the community is as healthy as it can be. One other thing I think people might not know is you showed up at an event my wife held in her business and there you were playing your guitar. Well, I, I like playing guitar, for sure. I like, uh, I'm learning a little bit of piano as well at 60, which is a challenge to right. get both hands working together. Um, but it's good for the brain and uh, I want to yeah. remind people if they want to avoid Alzheimer's, there's all kinds of techniques and things that you can do to help uh, and, everything in their side. And lifelong learning is part of that package. Absolutely. And speaking of that, you're still um, working on a PhD, or you have been. It gets put on hold because of politics. Well, yeah, it was a privilege to be invited to join uh, Christie's uh, cabinet. I was uh, the Ag Minister for four years, but it's impossible to be a, a minister and do other things. Uh, uh, your first priority, of course, is being an MLA, so to your constituents. Being a minister is on top of that. So as an MLA, I was able to work on my PhD on, on health economics. Uh, but once I became a minister, I asked UBC to uh, give me a pass and uh, withdrew from the PhD program. I achieved candidate status, which is great. That means I only have to work on my thesis. Uh, but I couldn't uh, finish that. So now that I'm in opposition, my priority is still, of course, being an MLA, advocating for the needs of my constituents, like uh, Rutland Middle School, you know, continually increasing in services at KGH and other things, transportation, you know, finishing what we're doing on Highway 97, for example, fixing Beaver Lake Road intersection with 97. All these things are the priorities that I have that I advocate for when I'm in Victoria, along with my colleagues, uh, Steve Thompson and Ben Stewart now. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's still some time left over to do some work uh, apart from that uh, public service side. So that's why uh, right now I'm, I'm focusing on, uh, in my spare time, <laughs> quote unquote, yeah. uh, looking at the thesis project for, for my PhD. And I guess we'll see if you're able to pursue, pursue that or not because we will find out in a few weeks whether or not you may or may not have a shadow cabinet role as a critic. Right, so the, um, when uh, Rich Coleman took over as leader of, of our caucus, uh, he uh, asked me to help uh, Ian Payton, who is the eye critic, and get him up to speed because he was brand new and I did that. Uh, but I said I would do that until we had a new leader, and I met with Andrew Wilkinson, our new leader, uh, along with all the other colleagues, my other colleagues that I met with Andrew, usually about half an hour, one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, we discussed, you know, what the future is for Norm, how can I best serve uh, my constituents, but also serve the province. And now he takes all that information from all his people uh, uh, in the caucus. And within, uh, I would suspect, this week or next week, uh, we should hear back from Andrew as to what critic roles he wants people to take. I don't think there'll be a lot of shuffling. Uh, you know, there might be a little bit um, because most people seem to be happy in their roles. Uh, and then uh, Andrew will let me know what my uh, new job is. Right. If, if he doesn't uh, have a job for me, then I can finish the PhD. And if he does have a, a job for me, then I guess the PhD gets on hold again. Right. And another thing that could change your job would be if the government changes again. It does seem a little tenuous. I guess it's holding together for now. But we've got this NDP. Green Party coalition that uh, holds on to power at the moment, but uh, how tenuous is that, do you think? Well, you know, everybody out there has an opinion as to how long they're going to last, and, uh, you know, Andrew Weaver is out there saying he's going to bring down the government, you know, almost on a monthly basis for one thing or another, and never does. What people don't see is he, he 
talks, a big talk, and uh, you know, criticizes the government as he should because he's not part of the government per se. Uh, but when it comes time to vote, they always vote with the government. Uh, so until he actually votes against the government, most of us think he's in for the long, long term. Right. And, and there's a couple of reasons. One is proportional representation. Uh, you know, that's that's the uh, the brass ring for the Green Party. Uh, right. They want to be able to uh, to go through a referendum, and they hope to achieve success in that. Uh, so he's not going to do anything uh, right. to jeopardize that. It is almost a miracle for them, for the Green Party, to I mean, to hold the balance of power with so few votes. I mean, it, it, it's a fluke of <coughs> politics that they're in that position. And, yeah. and uh, do you do you think though sometimes that because of that that it's the tail wags the dog? Because you know, they, you know, all they need is one vote, and it messes things up for John Horgan and company. Well, you know, they have an agreement between the two parties. Uh, basically, a no surprises rule uh, that they have to consult with each other to make sure that uh, the Green Party is up to speed. So they have an opportunity as the Green Party to influence decisions that the NDP are doing. And you can see it all over the budget. All those tax, uh, higher taxes, new taxes. Uh, you know, the Green Party is. If you look at the platform. That was advocating uh, a tax on your primary residence, not only a speculation tax, but a tax on your primary residence right. if you had a capital gain of over 750. So yeah. they, you know, you you have the the BC, in my mind, you have the BC Liberals, which are center center right. You got the NDP, which is center center left. You got the Greens left of the NDP. Right. So it's it's pulling them left. Yes, uh, undoubtedly. And uh, you you mentioned it. You know, you can pretty much stand in line to give the speculation tax another good whipping, but it seems incredibly unpopular. It's so. It, in fact, it's hard to find any individual with any uh, sort of um, background uh, to argue in favor of it. I think some people who advocate uh, for the impoverished have pointed out that maybe it actually is a good idea. But boy, in the, in the business community and among the public. I don't think I've ever seen such an unpopular tax around here. Well, it, it's the problem is it's not a speculation tax. It's a tax on assets. It's a tax on wealth. So if you've decided to work hard all your life and put money into, let's say, a, a cabin in British Columbia in one of the regions that the NDP have targeted, like Kelowna, um, and you've chosen to do that instead of maybe going on holidays every year and spending your money or having a new truck every year or whatever else that you've rightfully chosen as a Canadian to spend your hard-earned dollars on, then they're saying, well, since you've accumulated wealth that we can actually tax now, and since we made all these promises in our budget, and we need to find money, we're going to come after you on your, on your property. So, so you're viewing it as a... Uh, Asset as, tax. As a cash grab, rather than really something aimed at achieving this goal of, re, of cooling down the real estate market. Well, it's definitely going to have a cooling effect. Even the finance minister has said that it's probably going to reduce the, the price of housing maybe 20-25%. Well, the, what kind of chills that sent to everybody who's looking at buying a house? They're going to say, whoa, 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 I'll wait until the market crashes and then I'll come in. There is a real issue there. I look at my kids. How, how are they ever going to, with the prices we have now, how are they ever going to look forward to buying a house? And I don't, I can't think of a way that doesn't cause total mayhem to, to cool prices to the point where that would be an issue. It, it's, it seems like a bit of an unsolvable problem. Well, you know, there are a lot of ways that we can do that, and we are doing that. Look at the city of Kelowna with the, the density that it's going towards, right? The uh, the tax holidays for purpose-built rental accommodation. You know, those are just two of the many uh, levers that people have, that, pro that the province has as well. You can do things like Whistler has, which is a non-profit housing corporation that actually builds housing at 15 to 20 percent below market value and, and offers those kinds of units to right. people that, that are in need of them. There's a number of ways to do that. What about this other alternate way, uh, that I've heard? Um, sort of an alternative to the speculation tax where people say a, a flipping tax. Absolutely. You, you, sure, I, why not? I'm, I'm, I'm a true spec hear, tax, right? I, I, I'm amazed to hear even <coughs> people on the right wing, the pro-business people, seem to be even okay with that. Well, right now there is a capital gains tax. So if you are speculating in housing and you make money, you pay taxes on your yes. profit. Okay? So I, I think we all agree that the capital gains tax is there and we should respect that. The other piece is what happens if you buy a piece of property and then flip it within a year, let's say. Are you speculating? Well, I think most people would agree that, yeah, you're really speculating. Unless, of course, you got transferred as an RCMP member right. somewhere else in this, you know, some, uh, some circumstance. But for the most part, I think most people would agree that a true speculation tax is fine. Right. The problem here is that 
it's not a speculation tax that the NDP are bringing right. It's well, an asset tax. Well, maybe, it's a wealth tax. Maybe there could be a conversation that ends up, I mean, if, if truly the idea is to is to cool that element of the, what's fueling the real estate market, then maybe that's agreeable. Well, I, I would hope that that was the purpose, but I, like I said, the primary yeah. purpose from my perspective is that they need money to fund all the promises like $10 a day daycare, uh, no tolls on the Port Man Bridge, all those things that they want to do cost money. Where are they going to get it from? They're not going to get it from higher income taxes. They've already raised income taxes. They need to, to they say they need to tax people's assets. And, and like I said, the Green Party's platform talks about taxing uh, capital gains on your primary residence over $750,000. So the NDP isn't proposing that yet, but they're really close. So this is a thin edge of the wedge, and we have to continue to make sure that the NDP go back to the drawing board when it comes to the speculation tax. Make it clear to everybody in, in our country that this, they made a mistake, they're going to take it back, and they're not going to come after your personal wealth. Wow. Seems like every interview we do ends up being about the speculation tax these days. <laughs> Who knows? We'll, we'll <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it really is a thin edge of the wedge, right? It really is, because back in the 90s, the NDP had an asset tax. So if you had a business, you, like your winery, for example, you have a business, not only did you pay tax on the income, the profit that you made, you paid a tax on the value of your assets. What happens if you had a loss that year? You still had to pay a tax on the value of your assets. Now, when, when our government took over after 2001, and I wasn't there, but they took away that asset tax. So the NDP now are saying, well, we're back in power. We have, the, we have the Green Party that supports us because their platform is even further left than ours with, this, with the tax that I just talked about before. So let's bring in this asset tax, but we'll call it a speculation tax. So that's, that's the problem. That's why we get so incensed. If they actually just came out and said, we're going to have an asset tax, we're going to go after people. Oh, you'd still be against it, but it, yeah. you think it would be more honest. Well, it would be. All right. Well, we're sort of out of time. Oh, sorry. Norm, thanks. <laughs> Norm Lightning, MLA for Kelowna Lake Country. And you're watching Kelowna Now.